Welcome back to A Lifetime of Mafia Tales. Today, Sal and I talk about the ninth Mafia hitman that Sal was close to. His name was Andrew Curl. Andrew was an associate of the Gambino crime family under John Gotti. Andrew was another hitman in the Mafia, and when he was involved with the life, he did some very sick things. Andrew never did become an informant though, but he was convicted of killing his girlfriend by the name of April Ernest. Sal talks about meeting April and what she was like. Andrew was convicted of her murder even though the body of her was never found. Andrew's brother would become a witness against him and describe how his brother would dispose of her remains. Sal talks about meeting Andrew before all this went down. Andrew used to steal cars for Sal along with some other young mobsters. Andrew may still be around to this day. There isn't much known about him. I couldn't even find a picture of him. I will say that there's a lot of court documents about him though. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to get more videos like this. Also, please subscribe to our Patreon if you want to get an exclusive story about Andrew Curro. Good morning, Sal. How you doing? Good. It's pretty good. I'm out here in, uh, in crispy Cleveland hanging out for a couple of days, you know. Yeah, sounds pretty cool. Uh, man. Yeah, just visiting. Yeah, it's okay. Well, uh, today we're going to be going into uh, Andrew Curro, who was uh, a I don't know if he was ever a made man or just an associate, but he was under Gotti's crew and the Gambino family. There's not a lot known on this guy at all. So, you know, what, what I did find and what you knew about him and your relationship with him, we're going to go into today. He was, I mean, from his cases that he, he had, he was, Andrew was convicted of committing a murder on a woman by the name of April Ernest. And then as well, he was convicted of doing uh, car robberies or arm robberies along those lines with some other guys. But, uh, you know, he eventually, he was another one of those guys that got sentenced to life in prison and he was younger than you. So with you being a, your relationship with him what was that like when you had met him well you know i met him in the mid 70s maybe 76 77 and um i think i met him through peter peter zaccaro or carmine agnello who was uh john Gotti's son-in-law there was a whole bunch of young car thieves peter carmine andrew curro frankie burke uh, these guys were all like 21, 22 years old in the late 70s, and they were, they were car thieves. All of them were really good car thieves. And uh, I, gave, I gave them work, you know, because some of those guys were early on were, you know, cocaine users, and uh, not everybody was as uh, consistent as Peter. Peter was a good car thief. If I told him I wanted, you know, three Chevys, three Pontiacs, three uh, cutlasses, he would get me exactly what I wanted. But Andrew was a good car thief also. I mean, he worked for me for about a year or two, I think. Um, as far as I knew, uh, Andrew wanted to do other things and get closer to the Gotti crew when I met them. But it was like, you know, 77, 78. And Gotti had just gotten out of jail in the summer of 77. So it must have been 78, 79. That's the time that I was deeply entrenched in the uh, stolen car business and the chop shops. So that's what he did for me. Uh, sometime maybe around 1980, Peter and uh, Andrew sat me down asking me what I thought of them doing an armored car heist. They were, they were focusing on heisting a company that had an armored car business called IBI. And they told me all about it. I didn't think they were going to pull it off, but eventually they did. So that might have been in 80 or 81, something like that. Uh, by 1979, though, I had, uh, I had left the car business, so I didn't pay much attention to Andrew. Most of my uh, you know, activity with Andrew and Peter was 78, 79, like that, with stolen cars strictly stolen cars. I mean, I did lead Peter into the drug business, the heroin business, but I wasn't really that close with Andrew. He would just show up and uh, provide me with stolen cars. That's what he did. I mean, they talked about the IBI heist, and then they went out and did the IBI heist. They came back and bragged about it, and then Peter wanted to get close to Angelo. Somehow through Coniglia, Charles Canigli, I think Peter got close. I had no 
direct information exactly what Andrew was doing. But, you know, from what I read years later, they did two armored car heists and they killed a armored car guard. And then the girl, April, who I had met, she was a cute little thing. She disappeared. And then it took a while for the authorities to figure out that he murdered her. And I think uh, Andrew Curl's brother wound up giving the information that Andrew murdered her, cut up her body, and actually drank her blood. Yeah, I mean, that was a brutal, brutal kill that we'll go into right now because, you know, I'll, I'll read from what I researched as well. But, yeah, the, what you say is accurate to what I read. So, Andrew, he was convicted of the second-degree murder on November 11th, 1985, for uh, killing April Ernest, his 19-year-old girlfriend. Her body was never found. During the three-week trial, Andrew's brother, Gerard Curl, right. said the Andrew told him that uh, April was uh, afraid. He was afraid that April was gonna rat on him because uh, about the 1980 armor armored car robbery. And so John Gotti also was facing federal charges for this in the district court for from this robbery as well. So. April was last seen at the Brooklyn disco called uh, Scandals. You ever Scandals. heard of Scandals? Yeah, popular, popular disco. Yeah. Okay. And uh, prosecutors said that she was upset when Andrew showed up at the club with another woman. Andrew became afraid she was going to spill some information he had given to her about this armored car robbery and later went home and lured her into a car with two other associates. So, during the trial, Andrew's brother Gerardo testified against uh, him, saying that he killed April by strangling her, cutting up her body, putting the pieces in the bags and dumping them. I'm not sure where he dumped them, but the brother also said that the head was the most difficult uh, par body part to take off. The arms were easily were easier, and they uh, the intestines came out like big spaghetti. Police said that Andrew later bragged about drinking his girlfriend's blood. That's sick. what I got on that. Yeah, yeah, pretty sick. I mean, I didn't see him as a sick, demented killer. Uh, of course, I was already long gone from New York in 85. I was in the witness protecting program, and I started to read about some of these things that these guys got involved with. You know, because I had met them like, say, ten, eight or ten years earlier, and I didn't see them as, uh, you know, vicious killers. But, you know, they got involved with uh, Coniglia and the Gotti group. And um, I wasn't surprised though, because Peter, Peter wanted to be a gangster badly. He just wanted to be involved with, with the mob. And that's who, uh, you know, who, that's who I thought introduced me to Andrew back in the late seventies, but he was a good car thief. That's about, you know, as much as I can tell you what he did because I left New York in 82. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, you know, with Andrew as well, I mean, go into a little bit more uh, detail, I suppose, about his personality. Like, what what was he? Because, you know, back then, maybe he wasn't fully in the, the whole life. He was just on the edge trying to get in. And, like, maybe, you know, the life kind of, you know, he wanted to get deeper and deeper, like you said, like Peter did. And maybe it overcome him, took him, and then just became into the sick killer. You know what I mean? Or did he come yeah. off like that to you in the beginning? I don't know. Yeah, I think he wanted to make an impression upon Angelo and John Gotti. Uh, after they did the first armored car robbery and I saw them, they were celebrating and, you know, they were pounding on their chests like they were badasses, you know. And uh, I was surprised they pulled that off. But then they did another IBI, the same company, did another armed robbery uh, on, the, um, on that armored truck. And most of that I read about later on. Um, but I did, you know, sort of congratulate them from pulling off that robbery because robbing an armored car is very difficult. What did, what did you tell them when you congratulated them? What was I, your I, I told them right out. I mean, that's quite an accomplishment. I mean, if they would have kept low profile and they didn't get involved in, uh, you know, bragging about what they did on the street, they wanted to prove themselves to, to Gotti and Angelo and all those guys. Uh, they just were really young. They were in their 20s. 
<clears throat> and they thought it was like a trophy, you know, to become an armored car thief. I mean, they knew I robbed banks, you know, back in the 70s. And, uh, but things had changed a lot between the 70s and the 80s. There was technology. There was starting to be cameras, you know, early on. So I'm sure they were being monitored. And then the feds probably had some kind of information from other informants. I mean, you never know what, what the feds had on these guys, you know, but it took years. I mean, it was 85 when he got convicted. I mean, he did this like in 1980. Yeah. So it took years for the what, feds to convict him. What, what is the IBM that you're, is that what you call it? The heist? IBI. IBI. Was, so what, what, what were they? IBI wrong? company. And I think Charles was involved in one of those robberies because I never got the details about that. But Charles was convicted of, of killing an arm, armored car guard. So I think maybe that was what Andrew was involved in. I don't, I don't remember exactly what Peter was involved with as far as the armored car uh, killing. But... I mean, if we did a little research, we probably could find out. And there was so much going on at that time. No, uh, no, there was a lot. And even another thing that Andrew was, uh, you know, reported to be involved with as well was the assaulting on, uh, well, there was a few other guys that had sh went and shot John Gotti's uh, daughters, I believe his boyfriend. I don't know if they were married, Carmine Agnello. He uh, got shot in the ass a couple times, and <laughs> I read that. I mean, you know, Carmine was—he sort of was a quiet car thief. I, I mean, I think he's still involved in the auto business. You know, actually, I think he's out in Cleveland. You know, <laughs> really? From, from yeah. What I read, he was arrested for uh, stuffing automobiles with sand and tires so he could make the car way more when he could sell it. You know, to the scrap scrap scrapyard <laughs> business and uh yeah you know he got married to to uh victoria gotti they had a couple of kids and then he left he left new york i don't know how much time he did i never paid much attention to carmine after well, he uh after, after he i left the car the auto car you know the hot car business yeah I didn't pay much attention to to angelo but he did marry gotti and they had a big wedding and all so yeah, I mean, I mean that's what I'm saying. So like someone that became an, an informant, they had reported this whole thing. They were a Gambino family associate. So you know, let's see. Uh, I mean, this was the, the whole shooting was done for because uh, Carmine was to be punished for dating John Gotti Senior's uh, daughter. You know what I mean? So I don't know if that was, uh, you know, he just didn't obviously like Carmine. I don't no, know. I don't he wanted he someone did. else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be married but, to his daughter but she married him you know and then he started having kids you know yeah and, so uh, i guess the family events i mean if they probably were hanging out together oh man that was probably something else <laughs> yeah. shot, he was shot in the ass you know <laughs> yeah maybe we'll have to do an episode on carmine one of these times because i guess he was another interesting guy you knew yeah i didn't know a lot about him like i said i mean these guys that were car thieves that's what i my involvement was strictly for them to provide stolen cars to me. I didn't get involved. I mean, Peter, yeah, Peter, I sort of shared some heroin business and information about. But as far as Andrew and Carmine, Frankie Burke, you know, he, he was just another good car thief. I mean, that's all I was focused on with these guys because I needed, you know, five, six or seven cars a day to, to dismantle them. What about uh, with Andrew? Did you ever go on do any other crimes or around each other for besides no. just the whole car car? No, game? I didn't spend any any business time or any social time with Andrew. As far <laughs> as I was concerned, Andrew was a young sort of a young type of a punk. I had no clue he would later get involved in murder. I mean, this was the time when you know those guys who were in their twenties they want to impress Angelo and Gotti. What what they could do. And I think a lot of it was, you know, sort of sanctioned by Charles Caniglia. They looked up to Charles because Charles was the same age as I. And so, you know, in the early eighties, I was 35 and Charles was sort of, Charles was sort of a mentor to Peter and, 
and Andrew, as far as I knew. Yeah, so, I mean, what's to having that kind of mentor, man? I mean, you've seen what these guys ended up doing. I mean, they became, yeah. you know, killers for the, you know, God, basically. Killing a lot, yeah. I, I do know that there was a, a connection between Charles Caniglia and a guy who owned a huge scrapyard, and they would take a car over to this other scrapyard and, and crush it up into a cube. So, you know, Caniglia had the, uh, the availability of killing somebody, putting him in the trunk of a car, and then they would go and crush the car up into a little cube and never be seen again. So I'm sure some of that was done. As far as I read, Charles was involved in putting bodies in, in drums of acid. So maybe, maybe Andrew was involved. I know Peter was involved with Charles deeply as far as the drug business and killing people. It was pretty sick. I mean, they were really about as sick as you can imagine. Of course, you know, Charles Canigli, I knew that he was torturing girls and young women. So I, I, I just didn't associate with him. I mean, once or twice, I maybe got involved with him to do with some stolen car parts. So he was a good, you know, he was really good with locks. He was good with uh, auto locks. As I told the story about the robbery that I once did, he made a key for me for a, for a car so I could, you know, steal the jewelry out of the car with anybody, without anybody seeing me. Right. Yeah. So I think as well, you know, Andrew and Charles, they both, they were both involved with, uh, you know, doing those hits and stuff on women and taking it to a whole new level that, yeah. you know, a lot of other guys wouldn't cross getting involved with taking out women. Yeah. I mean, what were your thoughts on that? I think it was sick. I mean, you know, it's as far as I remember, that was never any part of my life, uh, hurting women and children. I just stayed away from that. I had a strong line when it came to the type of crime I was involved in. Yeah, the drug business, you know. Um, I just didn't, uh, I didn't appreciate what I was hearing about Andrew early on. And then eventually when I left, I read all this stuff that he, he killed that girl, April. I mean, it was terrible, it was a terrible thing, I mean. Well, you had met April, and I, I guess me and you haven't really discussed that. So what what was it like? What was your encounter with her? Well, she was just a young girl hanging around with, uh, you know, two guys that were exciting. They were car thieves. They had a lot. Of, they had made a lot of money. They had fancy clothes and jewelry, and, you know, they'd go to nightclubs. That's not exactly what I was had any interest in by 1980. Really, I, I just stayed away from them. I, I could see something strange going on there. So I backed away from Peter. And I didn't even see Andrew at all after maybe 1979, 1980. I mean, I think they did the armor car heist around 80, 81, something like that. So, and they, they bragged about it. You know, it was the whole neighborhood knew they, uh, they hijacked an armored car. I mean, they, <laughs> they didn't make it a secret. They just wanted to brag about it. And you told them to keep it quiet, basically, uh, when you're con congratulating them? Yeah, they couldn't keep it quiet. I go, hey, that's a pretty ballsy thing you did, you know. But uh, I believe they, I'm not sure if they sold the first, the money from the first robbery to the Gotti crew or the second. There must have been some brand new bills in that armored car, and they were afraid they were going to get caught with the money. So. Yeah, and because because of that, I believe that they got involved with, you know, Gotti faced federal charges for being involved with this uh, this robbery. So that could be exactly what you're saying. You know, is that is I don't think he was actually on the scene doing the robbery, but you know, if they went and sold that money to him, yeah. From then, what I heard from an FBI agent, it was interesting because of that robbery. It sort of put Gotti on the radar on the map, like. I don't think Gotti was ever convicted of that IBI robbery or receiving the money. But the prosecutor in the first trial, her name was Diane Jacqueline, she she was the one that initiated the investigation into the whole Gotti crew, uh, which opened up a myriad of, of charges and all kinds of other crimes he was involved in. And they they probably had information. I'm sure Willie Boy, Willie Boy Johnson knew Peter. So, you know, he probably gave information. I don't know how much information they had, but a lot of times you won't find out what the FBI had on anybody until years later. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I mean, even in Andrew's case, there was yeah. not much, really. So, 
you know, I mean, with him, he also didn't become an informant. So that's why there's not much information as well from yeah. what what he had said. You know, Peter, there was more articles and all kinds of different stuff that I could find. But Andrew, you know, there was a select few of court documents that were really out there. <laughs> I didn't read who 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 testified at the uh, Andrew Curl murder trial. I think it was his brother. I don't know who else yeah. they had. For sure, his brother. And I mean, that was the only one that I seen. I mean, that his yeah. brother on the, on this April Ernest thing, because he went to his brother and let him knew, know what happened and how he disposed of the body and drinking the blood and all that. I mean, yeah, that 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 was a long drawn out time period from where he killed her, and then to when he actually got convicted. Five because years. It's, I think. It, it's so rare that a prosecutor would bring a, a murder charge against someone without a body. I mean, how could you even say it was a murder? And that's what I was going to say, too. That's what we uh, should segue into. I mean, this whole case, he was convicted and there was never a body. Right. And, I mean, they had to have had multiple, you know, testifying people. I mean, how, how did they, you know, pin it on him? I don't know. Or not pin it on him, but, like, how did they make it stick? I, I, I don't know. I never read much about it. There wasn't a lot of news about him being convicted of that robbery. No, and I couldn't even find a mugshot of the guy. And I could yeah. find his court documents. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's all. I mean, so he existed. He's real. You know what I mean? The, the, he's not like he's, I don't know. There was no pictures, nothing of him. And I don't know if he's in jail today. I have no clue. Because I mean, I mean, he would be he would be in his 60s now, probably 62 or 3 or something like that. You know, because I think he was like 18 or 19 or 20. In, in 78, 79. So that means he would be in the 60s by now, like Peter. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean Peter's 68, I think. And An and uh, Andrew was about the same age. So he spent most of his life in prison, if if not, if he's still there. Well, let's go into that, I suppose. You know, him being sentenced. So what I read was that, <clears throat> you know, the judge had, uh, when he was given the the sentencing, he said he comp there was reported that he compared the, the strangling of the girlfriend April Ernest to uh, crimes that were being committed in the Holocaust, you know, and terrorist airport bombings in Rome. So he, he was like comparing, you know, this nasty killing to you know stuff right. like that. So the judge sentenced Andrew to a maximum term of twenty five years to life in jail, in prison. I'm sure that's what that meant. And then saying if the judge said, if I could impose the death penalty or life imprisonment without parole, I would. The sentence is to run consecutively with the 1982 sentence against Andrew of 16 years in prison for a robbery conviction and a five to 10 year term for a murder imposed by the judge. Had two other uh, arm, arm car robberies as well. So when he was being convicted, he just laughed as the as the judge read this verdict. So he just laughed and smiled. I mean, he got, he must. So, I mean, I would imagine he's still around, you know? Well, you know, if you think about it, most people don't understand truly what a consecutive sentence is, which meant he had to do the first 16 years. Yeah. Then the sentence for the murder would begin. Mm -hmm. So conceivably he could be in for 40 or 50 years, uh, you know, in prison. So right. if that was in 85, he might still be in prison. I mean, he may spend his whole life in prison, you know, which is, you know, which is a terrible thing to do uh, for, I don't know. And back in the day, he probably thought he had to kill that girl to protect himself. I mean, she was going to go give the information to the feds. And I'm sure they had other information about those IBI armored car robberies. And so, uh, yeah, that was 85. That meant he might have killed her in 81 or something, or 82. It took years. And I had read that they, I think they actually threw the murder conviction out and they brought him back to trial for another trial. They were really, New York State was really intent upon convicting him without a body. And Man, I think they, maybe there's only been a few other cases where someone was convicted without a body of murder. Yeah, I mean, he, he uh, they really wanted him because if they would, if they didn't want him, they wouldn't have brought him back a second time. So to be able to do that without a body, yeah, that's something you don't really hear of like that. So, you know, right. I, I don't know. And if it's, I guess it's never been found, 
even you know to this day. And so I mean, the last report on him, you know, being live, Charles or not Charles, uh, a- Andrew was, uh, you know, after he got sentenced, that was really it. That was that was the only thing that was ever reported was he got that maximum twenty five years life in prison, right? And so I don't know. I mean, he definitely could still be alive. He could still be in there, or hell, he could be out. Well, uh, you know, you can uh, maybe we should Google uh, New York State prison prisoners uh, search. We can find out if he's still in there because basically, you just have to know someone's age within like two or three years in their name um, and you can get the information on when their date of release is damn. you can you can do that you can go to any state and search their prisoner prisoner uh base did you ever do that no i've never done that yeah it's not complicated if you go to new york state and put his name in we might get some more information uh you know because i don't think the news media covered that case too much. There was other stuff going on, you know, like certainly with Gotti and he was just, you know, insignificant maybe as far as the reporters did. Was there any mention in the uh, Charles Coniglia book about April? No, not really. I don't think so. Yeah. And I just read that one, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So there wasn't a whole lot in there about that or, you know, even with Andrew, he, he, there was that a, a little Gotti tie to being involved with this. Like I said, Gotti, they, they they gave him federal charges, but I don't think they stuck back in the 80s. Yeah. Right now. I don't think that Gotti was ever convicted of anything to do with Andrew. I think by 85, no. 86, they had already started the first RICO trial for John Gotti, and he had a couple of other charges that were dismissed. And that's why they gave him, you know, the name, the Teflon Don, you know, for a while. So until, and then he was acquitted in the 86 case that I testified and Charles was on that case also. And then it was five years before Sammy flipped and testified against Gotti. So Gotti wasn't even convicted until 92. Yeah. So he definitely wouldn't have been convicted of this then. No. He was facing federal charges, anything associated with this. Yeah. Right. So, no, I mean, that that's, I mean, if there's any more you can really throw in there about Andrew, just, I mean, I don't know, just let me know, because I, I, that's all I really got. Yeah, he, he was sort of, he was sort of a under, under the radar type of a character, and I don't know what else he did besides steal cars, and they did those two armored car heists, and they run around the neighborhood bragging about it, and uh, I don't I don't know. Maybe they never realized that sooner or later the feds were going to be all over them for that, for that case. Right. And they kind of went to you and they, they're the ones that asked you, you know, Peter and Andrew, they, they kind of looked to you to see what things they could top you. I mean, they, they did the, the arm, the car robbery or the arm robbery shit. So. Yeah. I I thought it was just idle, idle talk, but they actually committed that first IBI heist and they came and bragged about it to me. And uh, you know, I told them, you know, you got to keep that stuff quiet, man. The feds are going to be all over you, you know. <laughs> and then they went and did another one, and I think Charles was involved. I don't know for sure. You know, there was so much going on in the early '80s that I just got out of New York and didn't pay attention. I wasn't interested in, in the gossip or the or the rumors of what they did. They were young guys looking to make names for themselves. That's what they were doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, really, we, we what we could go into now is maybe what people can learn from the story. So, I mean, you know, look look what this life can do to you, you know, being yeah. involved in criminal life and, you know, yeah. spending, the, spending the rest of your life in prison. Uh, you know, the criminal life, I mean, if you get it too far into it, like these guys, I mean, they became, uh, you know, sick killers. That's really what it yeah. came down to. So, yeah, and I mean, Peter, here it is, uh, 40 years later, you know, he's in the witness protection program, ruined his whole life. Uh, I guess he decided to get out like Anthony Reggiano, get out of the life and move on. But it doesn't leave you. It follows you around wherever you're going. You know, you got to have a good mindset. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to commit any more crimes. I mean, from what I hear, most of these guys you know, they still stay involved with some type of criminal activity. For me, when I left 
New York in 1985 when the government moved me to Texas. I never once spoke with a criminal. I never once saw a gun. I never once saw any drugs. I just made a cold cut away from a life of crime. And I found ways legally to make, you know, money, lots of money also. So I read most about that. And every time I read about all these guys who were going to jail or who got killed, I just shook my head and said, boy, God was good to me. I got out of that life. I mean, really. Yeah, was, really. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what do you think uh, when you met Andrew and stuff, what, what, what do you think he could have went possibly went down if he went, was a legit guy? I don't know. He, he was uh, street smart. You know, he's yeah. the streets. I think Peter was even smarter. Peter, Peter could have did anything in life and been, been successful. He had a great, great personality. He was fun. I mean, he was always smiling and happy to be alive. And I think he got sucked in. He got sucked in with, uh, with the life with who knows how many guys with Charles Caniglia and whoever else he, he got involved in. It's sort of like, you can't break this, this chain that you get, you know, torn and torn into, like, you know, you're just wrapped up in the life and you go from one crime to another crime. I think a lot has to do location. Unless you take, the animal out of the jungle, you know, the jungle still resides in the animal. Mm-hmm. And that, that was my feeling. Like you gotta you gotta break the cycle and leave New York because New York had all this influence with the mob, all kinds of influence, even legal businesses. So Peter, I'm not sure what he did after he went into the program. I didn't speak to him. I did talk to uh, an FBI agent that knew him and said that he quit crime. He did quit, but it was already late I mean, he spent maybe 20 30 years involved i think he testified against charles caniglia or maybe junior Gotti. i'm not sure what he did i just didn't pay a lot of attention to these guys yeah i mean they, it's just uh again another thing where you were involved with these guys and they they went home <laughs> you little did you know that you know these guys were you know killers i mean you yeah didn't, you wouldn't you didn't even know that they w- went on to yeah. be that until I never once had any conversation with these young guys, all those guys who stole cars from me, about killing someone. I never had a single conversation. Yeah, with Cataldo I did because I was around him for 15 years. But uh, those young guys, I, I really didn't. I mean, I trusted them to steal cars. But <clears throat> as far as other crimes, I wouldn't have gotten involved with any of them. As far yeah. as I was concerned, they were, they were really young and they were reckless. They were trying to make names for themselves. I mean, I remember seeing Charles Caniglia with Andrew at the diner. Uh, Charles Caniglia would go to a diner every morning, have breakfast and sit there and sort of hold court. And that's how I saw him, having a group of young guys around him that he influenced them to to stay involved in crime. Damn. Damn. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I mean, look who his mentor was, who his boss was. I mean, I mean, you know, you just kind of follow in his footsteps if you get too far deep into it. I mean, you were able to navigate it while being around Cataldo, you know, it almost happened, you know, committing the murder and stuff. But, you know, you didn't go that far. You got out of it before that. Yeah. I mean, what what is something that you think people could learn from Andrew's mistakes that he made in life, these horrible mistakes? Well, he just got so sucked into the life he wanted to brag about being a successful criminal, and he did. And then when you're involved with crime, sometimes you really think you have the freedom to commit any type of crime. You lose, you really lose focus on your life. And um, I don't think they had a strong line. I think Peter and Andrew wanted to prove that they were tough guys. I mean, yeah, they were tough guys, but you know, once you once you pull the trigger, you can't take it back. And I think they got so deeply entrenched, maybe trying to impress Charles Caniglia and Gotti and Angelo. He just went all the way and did this stuff, thinking they were going to get away with it. Yeah, and you know, another thing as well is Andrew when he was sentenced, he just laughed in court, and he didn't care. He had no care for what he yeah. had done. He just was yeah. like, you know what, sentence me. I don't care. I'm just going to laugh. That's that macho, macho attitude. I remember guys bragging about 
going before a judge. I think uh, there was a famous drug dealer. His name was Herbie Sperling, Jewish guy. He was around the Gaudis and the whole mob and all. And he went before a judge and the judge said to him, I'm going to sentence you to a long term because that's what you de deserve. And he, and he, he uh, responded to the judge, it's okay, judge, whatever time you give me, I won't even take my shoes off, he said. <laughs> and then the judge gave him natural life, and he died in there. Damn, and man. if you read about Herbie Sperling, if any, any of our listeners or viewers read about him, he was a badass drug dealer. He actually had his mother dealing drugs. Huh. This guy was a highline heroin dealer, and he was involved with, with uh, you know, with the Gotti crew and the, and the Purple Gang up in Harlem. I mean, it's, it was he was legendary drug dealer, Herbie Sperling. I think he was involved with Frank Matthews and Nicky Barnes. All these guys were very, very famous heroin dealers. And he was a tough guy. He died in jail, Herbie Sperling. You probably could read about him and think about all the things he did. Yeah. So, you know, when guys go up before a judge, they just... They have no respect for the judge, no respect for the law. They laugh and they scoff. And and I think that's what happened to Andrew, thinking that he was going to get somehow get his case reversed and get it thrown out because no one had been convicted of a murder with it, without a body for years and years. No, and that's maybe why he thought he would probably get an overturn or some some kind of, you know, you know, just get out of there somehow. Maybe that's why he was laughing, you know, just pissed, all that, all mixed together. But I think a lot of people can learn from these stories, like like his, you know, just stay away from the shit. Yeah, I mean, these guys go to jail, and when you're in jail, you sort of brag about the stuff you did. I'm sure he was bragging about the murders and his connection to the, to the Gotti coup and all. It's sort of like... A, you know, a label. They sort of label themselves. Oh, yeah, I'm with the mob guys. And, and after a while, I mean, you have to live with that. Uh, and you don't want to admit, you know, the terrible decisions you made. And I always look down upon those guys that killed anybody. You know, that's how I felt about it, you know. Yeah, well, I think this is a good stopping point to end. So, everyone, we're going to switch over to our Patreon account. If you want to subscribe to our Patreon, you can uh, go to the video description and see. But we're going to go over there and we're going to talk about what Peter, or let's see, uh, what Andrew's relationship was with Charles and John Gotti. So, thank you, everyone, for watching. And, Sal, do you got anything else you want to add before we end on here? No, you know, it's just like I was so removed from organized crime in the 1980s. I, I just shook my head reading about the stuff. Like, I was like amazed at how far a young guy like that, because he was young, he was involved in crime at 20, 21, 22 years old, how far he would go uh, to, to commit crime and then brag about it. Yeah, it's terrible. It's a terrible life. That wraps up the ninth Mafia hitman, Andrew Curl. Andrew is another example of someone who got wrapped up in the criminal life and had a horrible outcome. Andrew was convicted of doing some very sick things. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Please share this video with someone that's an at-risk criminal that you may know. You never know, it just might save a life. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interviews like this. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our Patreon channel if you want to get an exclusive story about Andrew Curl. In the video description, you can find Sal's autographed book, The Sinatra Club. Also, you can find the Sinatra Club playing cards on there. And we just added two new items on there as well. They're both ticket events that Sal was a part of at one time. One was the Sinatra Club. We're selling tickets that came from that movie night. There's also a card on there as well that Sal had leftovers from an event that he did called Dinner with the Mobster. Thank you all again for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.